government rather than the market to pick who comes in and comes in. So one thing to note is that, in fact, the provisional nominee system represents a pretty small slice of Canada's overall immigration policy. And it's been pretty contentious. Uh, but overall, Canada continues to have a skills uh, bias immigration policy. Uh, and I think that you will find that the voters in Canada and Australia support it pretty strongly. Uh, so I disagree that there's been a wholesale move in this direction. And actually, there is, you know, right now the anxiety is chiefly around refugee policy, but you know, we're not here to debate Canada, but I think that you guys could do a whole story about that. But I think that when you're talking about people who have physics PhDs who are driving taxis in Toronto, I will tell you a very interesting thing about these people, which is that as the economy grows, they are able to adapt successfully, not only because they have these PhDs, not only, but also because they're part of unusual support networks that facilitate upward mobility for them. And this is the subtlety that when you're talking about central planning, uh, that's actually kind of really hard to capture, but it turns out that looking at educational attainment is actually a pretty reliable proxy for this. So when you're looking at racial inequality in the United States, there's this new vogue uh, among social scientists, which I think is roughly right, uh, which is that the reason why we have persistent racial inequalities is not so much because of active racial animus, but rather because of social networks. Social networks tend to be racially bounded, right? Uh, so what you see happen is that when you have high-skill immigrants coming to affluent societies, uh, if you're looking at uh, you know, the Iranians in France or in Sweden, or if you look at uh, you know, other communities like this, and you know, one tends to make generalizations, but uh, there's a pretty strong pattern, uh, they tend to have networks that allow them to uh, identify employment opportunities, et cetera, pretty effectively. Now, when you're someone who has a very limited skill level, you often struggle to forge those connections with other people. Remember when I mentioned assortative mating before? That might have sounded like kind of a random thing to bring up, but the thing is that actually assortative mating doesn't just apply to mating, it also applies to friendships and other social relationships. If you have strong language proficiency, if you have a PhD, yet you're a cab driver, the thing is that you'll be able to one day strike up a conversation with the guy in the back of your cab who might be pretty impressed that you turn out to be a cab driver. Uh, you know, my father, for example, was a guy with an MBA from Indiana University, and I'll tell you something. It didn't count for very much in New York City in the 1970s because he did not know anyone. Uh, so I think that you know that's kind of a big part of the story. But then once he started to form those networks, then he was able to bring his skills to bear. So when you're talking about that mismatch, uh, you know, kind of actually that mismatch is very much a temporary matter. So in my view, it's no great tragedy to have PhDs driving cabs because if you pay close attention, they will not, not be driving cabs forever. And this is what you see when you look at longitudinal work on Canadian skilled migrants. Whereas when you look at folks, you know, for example, uh, who are from, drawn from refugee populations, you see very persistent patterns of entrenched poverty. And then you see that intergenerational transmission from one to the next. Why? Because of the struggle to form those social connections that are extremely important in a market-oriented society as opposed to a centrally planned society. So you're absolutely right. This entails some modicum of central planning. That's, that's absolutely right. It's also central planning to say that everyone who's been accused of a heinous crime is necessarily something we don't want to have in this country. Uh, there's going to be some level of arbitrariness with any policy that doesn't allow anyone into the country. But I think that we've identified pretty strong patterns. We've identified them comparatively, as well as in our own experience, that give us reliable information. And I think that you know, you're not going to be able to make perfect decisions. And actually, one suggestion I would have is to not necessarily rely on educational attainment, but there are a variety of other strategies you could pursue as well. For example, we could say that if you're an immigrant who has earned 2x the median household income in the United States for three of the last five years, uh, you know, you're allowed to come. You're subject to a less stringent quota. That seems like a reasonable expectation. And why would you do something like that? Well, it could be that you're someone with limited skills, but you're able to command an income that would virtually guarantee that you would not be eligible for various transfers. You know, that's one. There are many other strategies that we might pursue, but I think that to you know, say that this is central planning uh, you know, is to not acknowledge that uh, you know, when you're dealing with complexities of this kind, you have to make some kind of coherent break. Uh, you know, uh, one idea that Rehan repeatedly talks about is intergenerational poverty among those skilled immigrants. It actually, there isn't a whole lot of cases there's empirical fact on it. Oh, if, you look at, if you look at uh, Mexican, uh, Mexican Hispanic earnings, what, it, what they show, and educational status, uh, what that shows you is that first generation of Mexicans definitely, Hispanics definitely do have very low educational attainment. It's less, it's something like eight years. That's what they come to this country with, eight years of education. When you look at second year, it goes up to about 10 or 11 years of education, and the third generation is 13, which is almost at par with white native 
would refer you to the work of Jennifer Lee of University of California, uh, Irvine, uh, and she has done some pretty good work on it. And uh, the, where, where uh, third generation Hispanic start stagnating actually is college level education. But even there, it's very interesting that college education might stagnate, but they actually let earnings still keep going up. They go up from $25,000 to $45,000 to $65,000 in the third generation. And how do they do it? It is, they do it because in Mexican culture, in Hispanic culture, generally entrepreneurship is valued more than education. So when Rehan talks about networks and social networks, it's not only educational networks that matter. There are also business networks that matter, and that's what they have. It shows completely in Hispanic and Mexican rate of starting businesses. They start businesses at three times the rate of the native population. So uh, all in all, this idea that there's going to be this entrenched poverty of the underclass, which is just a sophisticated way of saying that we are importing poverty by letting those skilled workers in, actually doesn't have a whole lot of cases in mind. I recommend that everyone read a book called Generation Exclusion, which talks about the persistence of intense poverty, particularly when you're dealing with immigrants arriving in areas where uh, you actually have, let's say, a large Hispanic owned population initially, which makes it difficult to achieve some level of integration. Uh, and also, as you increase the amount of migration, it's more likely that you have something called ethnic replenishment. So when you look at what happened uh, in the 1920s, the immigration restriction of that era, uh, what you saw is that you stopped having continual immigration, and so you, let, you saw higher rates of intermarriage, and you saw actually a dispersion of the kind of networks that we're discussing that were one strategy for upward mobility. When she is talking about business ownership, it's important to make a distinction between self-employment and entrepreneurial businesses. And that actually has a you know, pretty big impact when you're talking about income. Uh, and when she's talking about how the gap is closing, I, I dispute that. I think that when you're looking kind of by the third generation. Uh, but another thing to keep in mind is that when you're looking at uh, first generation Mexican Americans, about 18% of the children they raise grow up in intact families. By the time you get to the third uh, generation, it's about 36%. So what you're seeing is that there is an assimilation to American norms. Unfortunately, it's assimilation to the norms that are prevalent among people with limited skills and education much of the time. Well, okay, thank you. What I'm going to do, um, spend, do you just do that? We spent yes. 35 minutes talking about, we can look and study. Talking about economics. <laughs> Tell me and, about the well, no, we're going we're to transition now. What a beautiful segue. Say where, it's, it's a, a beautiful segue, and we're going to talk about <laughs> assimilation, <laughs> assimilation <laughs> ding, ding, ding. But well, 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 I do have, you're claiming that actually. That, yes, the, what, the, look. Heather McDonald had popularized a um, working study called. No, no, no. Oh, so okay. there's, there's this notion that has been popularized about five to six years ago that Hispanics are assimilating into the underclass because there are lots of out of their job books and they're not growing up into uh, two parent families. Actually, that turns out not to be true. 77% of Hispanic women are married by the age of 30. So and come on, you are actually working actually. into my question. Uh, but, 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 no, 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 right. We're talking about generational norms, right? Yeah, this, what, I, what, I'm talk, what I want to talk about now is, is cultural assimilation, because that's what we're talking about here. What? Is there a, pro, and you can speak whatever you want to say here. And, yeah. <laughs> is there a problem where with open our borders, with looser borders, 